I am very happy to have this opportunity to describe some of uh, the, uh, recent work. So the title of the talk is Interacting Hard Rigid Rotors in Deep Dimensional Lattices. And it sounds a bit technical, but I'll try to keep it understandable. Doesn't move. OK. OK. Yeah, so this work, you know, I've been working on these models with hardcore particles for a very long time. There have been a large number of collaborators. But I will focus in this talk on some recent work and uh, only discuss, sorry. Uh, only this, so the pointer doesn't work. Ah, point. But okay, so, so there is Sushan Saryal, Julian Klemzer, and Tridip Sajhu. And these are the collaborators for this work. Okay, so I will start with some preliminaries and define the model. And then there is this very interesting at most one overlap condition, which makes the analysis of the problem non-trivial and simple. And that's what I will be able to explain, I think. And under this condition, the model becomes simple, something called dimer model, which is well unknown and well understood. And uh, then you can calculate properties of these, and one can study singularities in the distributions of objects and stuff. OK, but let me start with the preliminaries. So in spite of a large amount of work done in studies of phase transitions, uh, we still don't have a model of particles with realistic interactions that is exactly solved and shows the two familiar phase transition, solid to liquid to gas. So there are models which go solid to liquid transition. There are models which show liquid to gas transition. But there are no existing models which you can solve, which show both of these transitions at the same time. Unfortunately, in this talk also, we will not be able to produce some such model. But that was the starting motivation to kind of study models which show these kinds of phase transitions. So of course, it is known that if you take models with molecules interacting with Leonard Jones type of interactions, repulsive at short distances, attractive at bigger distances, you can get the solid to liquid to gas phases. But this is only seen in computer simulations. So the interactions which give rise to these phases are well understood. But the models which we can discuss analytically do, are not able to handle Leonard Jones type of interaction. So it, the aim is to find slightly modified interactions for which one can do this kind of stuff. Okay, So finding analytically tractable models, we show these kinds of phase transitions still remains a challenge. And that I will not be able to actually address in this talk. But anyway, so one of the simplifications people made in these Leonard Jones type of models was to study models of hard spheres. So in hard spheres, you just have repulsive interaction in spheres of radius sigma. and. Uh, so it initially, it was studied by Boltzmann, et cetera, in the context of non-ideal gases. Then there was perturbation theory, where people studied pressure as a function of density as a Taylor series. And term by term, these coefficients of the series can be determined by something called the Mayer expansion, which is well studied. You know, it's taught in BSc level textbooks in um, statistical physics. So it was clear in this expansion that the expansion has a finite radius of convergence. And already, Kirkwood in 1941 had argued that if the density becomes higher than some number, then there will be actually there will be a phase transition to a crystalline phase. And this was based on some approximate integral equation. So the Final result he got was right, but the argument used to get the result was approximate. And uh, it was not sufficiently convincing for most people. And the clear evidence that 
if you take hard spheres and you go to density beyond some value, you get actually a solid phase. It was only done by a computer study of Adler and Wainwright in 1962. So that is almost 60 years after um, Boltzmann and uh, 30 years after Mayer. And you might wonder why, you know, it took so long to realize this simple fact. Okay, anyway, so I uh, copied this title of the paper by Kirkwood in 1941. And here it says, when parameter decreases below a certain value, uniform density distribution of, uh, you know, when the density is low, you get a fluid phase. And when the density is high, then you get a periodic density pattern, crystalline phase. So all these words are there. And uh, so this is a very nice example, but usually people say geometrical phase transition started with the work of Onsager, which is 1950. And this is an earlier work. And actually it took me some time to figure, uh, to dig up this one. So I showed, I, I thought I will show it to you people as well. And uh, so, the, the point is just this, that if you take hard spheres, if you increase the density, there is a phase transition from a fluid phase to a crystalline phase. And that is called a geometrical phase transition. The, because these are hard spheres, the equation of state is simple. It is pressure is just a function of density multiplied by temperature. The temperature dependence is trivial because temperature doesn't show up in the problem. And the solid phase by definition has periodic density pattern in space. And uh, in three dimensions, there is a density discontinuity as a function of pressure. If you change pressure, then the, there is a jump in density. And if, even in this simple model, the exact equation of state is not known still. Okay, but you know, this is nice. So people say that hard spheres is an unphysical model. But there is actually, now these people can make colloidal particles, which are micrometer in size, much bigger than atoms. And the interaction between these colloidal particles is very well modeled by hard spheres. And here is a picture of a real experimental system. You take these colloidal particles and take pictures of them. And these are actually PT scan kind of pictures. It's a three-dimensional system, but you are taking two-dimensional cuts. And uh, you start with something and you change the time and from a disordered structure, it goes to a crystalline structure. So it's a experimental realization of hard sphere system, which shows a transition from an unstable fluid state to a more stable crystalline phase. Okay, so this model uh, of hard spheres cannot address questions like latent heat of melting, but one can see that the entropy change per sphere is of order KBT in this model, which agrees with experimental stuff. But then you can ask questions like, okay, but particles with other shapes than spheres, then you can have many more complicated phase transitions. So examples, people have studied that triangle squares, hexagons in 2D, and uh, octahedra cubes, long rods, etc., in 3D. And for a theorist, if you give me a shape of molecules, even finding the close pack density is non-trivial. And uh, what kinds of phases will occur in what order they will occur has been an interesting problem, which has been a challenge and it's not understood in general. Okay, so for a theorist, another point which is of interest for me was that the transition from the crystalline phase to the liquid state is not always a single phase transition. So sometimes, so the crystalline phase is the one where you have this um, three-dimensional lattice. Li can you, yeah. So uh, there is a broken crystalline symmetry, but uh, if you take some other non-spherical molecules, Often the melting occurs in stages, and there are mesophases, middle phases, liquid crystals, and orientationally disordered solids called rotator crystals or crustic crystals. Okay, so the liquid crystals are better studied, and you know it was studied by Dijen, and uh, there is there are thick books, so they, and they show many mesophases, and here the orientational symmetry is broken. For example, in, in nematic liquids. 
um, things align in some direction, but the translational symmetry is retained. Okay. In contrast, plastic crystals, they have crystalline lat reference lattice, but the orientational symmetry is not present. Okay. So they are different from uh, liquid crystals, and I we will discuss non-spherical hardcore particles. And we are trying to model rot this uh, second type of stuff, which is orientationally disordered solids. And this is a simple model. You take a lattice, but you put particles which are asymmetrical, and you they have arbitrary orientations, but they cannot interact. Mm, they cannot overlap. Okay, and so these models have only hardcore interactions, and show a sequence of geometrical phase transitions. So that is what my aim is to. Mm, describe in this talk. So, but you know, this is just an explanatory mm, picture which I took from some article. So, crystalline phase has, you know, crystal and uh, in between you can have smectic phases in which you have layers, or you can have nematic phases in which you have only orientational order and you can have isotropic liquid in which neither orientational order nor translation, you know, nor crystalline order is present. So there are two in-between phases. You can go from crystalline to smectic, where you know the there is a lattice. If you say if in two dimensions, but there are layers and there is a broken symmetry in one direction. Okay. So orientationally disordered solids. They were previously called plastic crystals. So many molecular liquids of non-spherical molecules and freezing first form a phase where the centers of mass of molecules form a lattice, but the orientations of the molecules are random. So these have been studied a lot since 1930, starting with the work of Timmermans. But usually in chemistry and in statistical physics, there doesn't seem to have been so much work on this topic. And uh, so this is what got me interested. On increasing temperature, there are multiple points where there are phase transitions and uh, you know the orientational order changes sometimes there are structural changes also and this is an example of a real liquid uh, cyclopentane so what is plotted is temperature versus specific heat and you can see that there are some phase transitions the high temperature phase is liquid the so called number phase number third phase is a regular crystal and in between there are two more phases we will see what these kinds of stuff do. Okay. So the model is like this. There is a lattice and there are molecules. I have just took some shape. So each molecule has a marked pivot point, which is in roughly this place in the same place for each molecule. But then you put these pivot points on the lattice sites and the molecules can o get arbitrary orientations. And you can take this model in 2D or 3D take just shape and put some pivot and just see what happens. Okay. And what we will do is we will keep the molecule shape the same, but change the lattice size and see the phase transition in the system as if you change the parameter A. Okay. A that is like equivalent of changing the density of the substance. Okay. So the kinds of stuff we will study are sort of simple shapes. So I take a lattice and I take linear rods and put one pivot at one end. That is the first model. Yeah, just because calculations are easy to do. You know, you can extend most of these results to other shapes, but the number of shapes is infinite. I cannot deal with each of them. So we deal with some representative shapes. The second one is similar, except you have rods and you pivot, put the pivot at the middle point. And the third one is similar to the second, except the lattice is a zigzag lattice. And uh, the fourth one is uh, we take disks which are circular, but put the pivot off center and uh, see what happens. You know, these are just typical uh, representative examples of the kinds of systems one can study. And this last one is very interesting because it looks just like the standard hard sphere case, because if you forget the fact that the pivots are on the lattice sites, it looks very, or the phase structure, or the structure of the material 
is very similar to standard hard sphere liquid. The phases are also somewhat similar. Okay, so summary of results first. There is a range of densities where this rotor model, there is a rotor at its site, has a very simple structure and it reduces to a well studied problem. And you see multiple phase transition. In fact, in some of these models, you can see infinite number of geometrical phase transitions as you change the slightly spacing. And uh, in some cases, we can study the phases, properties of phases in some detail and calculate the distribution function kind of exactly. Okay, so, but you know, I want to first show this slide, which takes the first model I took, th there was a line and pivoted at one end. And uh, we just do Monte Carlo and study the distribution of orientations. So the orientation goes from zero to two pi. And this is the density of P of theta versus the theta which goes from zero to pi only because you know it's symmetrical anyway. So initially you see that there is a periodic structure and there are peaks and there are some, sometimes there are some straight regions and there are non-straight regions. Then you increase this value of kappa, which is the length of the rod divided by A. And uh, at some point, there is a peak which becomes a dip. So there is a very sudden change in the orientational distribution function. Then you go to density below. Then up till some point, there was a symmetry, you know, they were mm, around pi by two. So structure on the left was same as the structure on the right up. But below that, it becomes one of them is favored over the second, and you get preference over this kind of mm, state over that one, which of course is a sim spontaneous symmetry breaking. And then you can have, you know, if you go further, even this one breaks, and uh, there was a symmetry about pi by four, and even that symmetry is broken later. So one can study the richness of phase diagram in this simple model. OK, so the equivalence to the Daimler model. This is a sort of uh, mathematical slide, but hopefully moderately straightforward. So you can take the dimensional generalization. M is a matrix um, which characterizes the orientation of the mm, molecule in d dimensional space. It's a d by d matrix, so belongs to the orthogonal group. and. Uh, in the partition function, you have to integrate over all possible orientations. And the quantity inside is just one if um, things don't overlap, and zero if any of them overlap. So it's one minus eta product over all pairs. Eta is one if they overlap, zero otherwise. So this is a simple definition. And uh, then the quantity we are interested is in the entropy per site which is the log of this partition function divided by n, and the n goes to infinity limit. And the phase transitions we'll see will be in this function s, which is defined in the thermodynamic limit. OK? So if uh, the uh, molecules have some size, but the lattice spacing is bigger than two times L, then they will just move around, and they will, be not known, they will never overlap. And so the entropy will be constant. And in my normalization, it will, the partition function will be 1, and the entropy will be 0. And then you, when you decrease spacing, the entropy will decrease below 0. OK? So now, su suppose the particles are such that there is a unique point in the particle, which is at maximum distance. OK, then if the distance is low enough, and you put mm, uh, the, if the spacing in the lattice sites is big enough, then you can have overlap. But if you have overlap in the x direction, then you cannot have overlap in the y direction. OK, so there is a range of lattice spacing where there is at most one overlap possible for any molecule. So let me just state, it's a simple geometrical observation, but let me just state it right. So I take one side, and uh, I put the molecule in whatever orientation I like. And all the neighbors are put in whatever orientation they like. 
but at most one overlap will be possible. So this is condition, says that if you take eta is this, the sites are called i, j, j prime, and the orientations are m of i, m of j, m of j prime, and these eta are overlap conditions. So product of two overlaps will be zero because they are sharing an i, whatever m b, and whatever i, j, j prime b. Okay, so that the blue stuff is called the at most one overlap condition. And uh, then you can see that if you have straight rods, then the, if the spacing is between 2L and root 2L, then there is this condition is satisfied. And you can take other cases. Okay, but now my partition function was that. And now I just multiply in the stuff on the right and expand. And whenever two etas come mm, together with the overlap condition, the product becomes zero. And all those terms drop out. And all the terms which remain are the ones which look like this, where the, the eta, this, the plot is of, whenever there is an eta in the product, I draw a red line, then the red line only comes separated from each other, right? So that is called the dimer model. And so the calculation of partition function there reduces the, to the calculation of partition function in this case, where all the integrals are easy because they are decoupled. Okay, so, so there is, so the problem reduces to a dimer model. There is an activity for each dimer. And um, this is a classical dimer problem. Unfortunately, even the dimer model is not exactly solved in these dimensions. But a lot of its behavior is known. So there is a density as a function of z. And uh, the partition function is a non-trivial function of z. And uh, the full partition function only depends on this calculation of z, which was this integral. So, you know, these are two body correlations and three, four body correlations don't show up because the AOO condition. Okay, so distribution of orientations. But now if I go to a site, it can either be, it will have no dimer or it will have a dimer in that direction or that direction or that direction or that direction. So each of these has a given probability and for this probability I can calculate the conditional distribution given that the orientation of the dimer is in that direction and the full orientation of the single site at mm, one point can be obtained as a conditional sum of conditional probabilities in various cases and uh, this Density average cannot be calculated exactly, but there is a Taylor series known. And the, it turns out that this AO condition holds only when Z is very small. In fact, Z has to be negative because of the, um, by definition, Z is a negative quantity. And so what you have to do is you have to actually analytically continue the results for the standard problem to the negative z regime. But it, it works very well to three places of decimal using only a first few terms of the activity expansion. And rho of z can be taken to be known. And then you can, these are Monte Carlo data compared with the theory. And so, you know, there is a perfect agreement between the theory and the simulations in this AOO regime. Okay, so now what happens if this condition is not valid? Suppose you have symmetrically placed pivots. You know, you had a rod and put something in the middle point. Then that condition is not true. Then the configurations you get are like the one showed here. So you can have either overlap in the x direction or in the y direction. Then the configurations are like these um, long rods with poly dispersity, which is a more complicated model for which even less is known, okay? So, but, you know, you can do Monte Carlo and it, it, this model also shows similar behavior even though AOO condition is not satisfied, okay? So infinite number of phases as a function of L by A. So this should be explained. So we define phases by answer to yes and no questions. So, you know, you have some model, you have some parameters you can vary. For each 
choice of these parameters, there is some state of the system. Then you change the parameter, the state of the system changes, usually continuously. But we will ask a qu yes, no question which doesn't change, so it remains the same. Okay? But then you change the parameter, suddenly your answer changes from yes to no. At that point, we say there is a phase transition. So, you know, in the solid to liquid case, I say, is there a crystal? Is there a crystal? Say, yes, yes, yes. And when it melts, it says no. So that is the phase. By definition, it's a phase transition can be defined as an answer to yes, no question. So now, I can ask a question that here is a lattice. Can a molecule overlap with some molecule which is a distance? Um, in the lattice, it is five lattice spacings away or seven lattice spacings away. The answer is yes or no, depending on the distance. And so the answer will suddenly change from yes to no when you change this. So that will be a phase transition. And it's a geometrical phase transition because it's defined by simple geometry. And this phase transition shows up in the entropy function as we define, which was the basic definition everybody uses. Okay. So here, if you have a two-dimensional case, you have one lattice side here, one side m n distance away, the distance is root m squared plus n squared. So for all integers m and n, when this ratio jumps over this value, then there is a phase transition. Okay, so, so then you get an infinite number of phase transitions, and these phase boundaries are independent of interaction strengths. They are just based, defined simply by geometry. In addition, these models show extra phase transitions where there are orientational transitions which are not mm, geometrical. Uh, they are order disorder type. So they can have Ising like or they can have um, other mm, stuff. I bring back this picture. So here, on the top, you see sometimes there is a flat region where the density of theta is independent of theta in some range. But then that range disappears or it contracts. We can calculate exactly the positions of these cusps. And then uh, I explained to you sometimes the maxima becomes minima, sometimes the symmetry is broken and it's broken further. And so you get a sequence of such phase transitions. And so here is a picture in which I have taken not hard spheres but soft spheres where there is a U. Whenever two rods interact, overlap, there is a interaction strength Q, which is finite. And so on one axis, you have plotted um, 1 by beta, which is temperature T. And on one axis, it is L by A, which is the 1 upon the lattice spacing. And so you see the horizontal lines are the geometrical phase transition. Each range corresponds to a different phase. In addition, there are these other phase transitions, which are temperature induced, which depend on the value of u. And so you get a huge number of different phases in this simple model. Okay, so this part I will sk actually skip, but the fact that there is a simple phase transition and you can calculate the properties of this system exactly shows that there is, so you can write, you often there is a transfer matrix formulation for this problem, which is usually used in statistical physics. And in this transfer matrix formulation, one can show that the, inf the transfer matrix is an integral equation, like this. The function of, as a function of theta is integral t theta theta prime, psi theta prime, d theta prime. There is some, some integral like that. So this integral equation has eigenvalues. And all eigenvalues, except for a finite number of them, are exactly zero. Okay, that is the mm, result one can deduce from very simple analysis of this model. And as a simple check, you can do this in 1D, and we can check that uh, there are only two eigenvalues which are non-zero, and all others are zero. And that is all, you know, if you look at the integral equation, that seems like a surprise, because it's not at all obvious that that will happen. Okay, so the last question I will try to address is what happens when this single overlap condition is not satisfied, when you decrease the lattice spacing further so that two overlaps are possible. Okay, 
So there is a singularity at A star, which is the value at which uh, this uh, at most one overlap condition stops being satisfied. So when you go for A smaller than this, at some point there is a rod which can interact with two other rods. A picture is shown here. So you can estimate the fractional density of such systems that goes like A minus A star to the power 3 by 2. There is some dimensional argument there. And so the singularity in S will be in the almost A O condition is satisfied, then there is a function. And when it is not satisfied, it's the same function plus uh, A minus A star to the power 3 by 2. So the, the S of A function has a smooth derivative, but a cusp singularity at the next level. Okay, and that is sort of again also independent of details of the structure. Not all valid all the time, but it it can be expected to be valid more generally than the special case. So let me just summarize with the uh, concluding remarks. So the model of hard rotor shows a large number of geometrical and order disorder transitions, both type. The problem becomes very simple for a range of densities where this at most one overlap condition is satisfied. And you know, it mm, seems like a very nice result can be put in undergraduate textbooks, but has not been done yet. And the transfer matrix has a particularly simple structure. And this structure is lost as soon as A is less than A star. So you know, we said that almost all the eigenvalues are zero. But once you put A less than A star, mm, all of them become non-zero. So you know, very suddenly this happens, and it's sort of interest in the theory of phase transitions. Okay, so the problem with asymmetric hard disks is an interesting variation of the standard hard disk problem. It shows geometrical transitions, also coastal is Fowler's transition, and glassy phases and all kinds of stuff. But uh, this is based on Monte Carlo, and this is not um, any rigorous analysis. And it is just to say that it's an interesting problem. It has not been studied well, uh, but seems to be interesting for further study. And uh, that is where I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Dhar, for that fascinating talk for a very, uh, what should I, fundamental problem. So any questions? Yes, yeah, so some of my friends at TFR said that they will make uh, experiment. So in some of these results are each even valid for finite system. They don't need an infinite size limit. So you can take rotors. You can actually make oh. them by hand and realize this. But it has not been achieved yet. It's easy to do. It can be done in many college labs and so on, but it has not been done. So it need not be molecules. It can be anything. It can so be anything. It can be real centimeter size rods. Oh. Any other questions? Very nice talk. Uh, so I was wondering, like, uh, if, if these, are, these are molecules, if mm. I think in terms of molecules, yeah. so then hard rods, mm. if you have a phase transition, mm. let's say from, uh, for, from liquid to solid, mm. then uh, we know there will be, in thermodynamic terms, there will be enthalpic and entropic. Yeah. So when you do not have this attractive potential, mm. then this, how that is feasible, uh, because entropy loss, I mean, entropy is decreasing, but there is no enthalpic gain in terms of uh, thermodynamics. Okay, so the fact that with these kinds of attractive well potentials, Leonard Jones or square well type or whatever, you can see different phases is well understood. I can talk to you in private. It is not a theoretical difficulty, OK? The explanation may not be easy in one sentence, but it is not a problem. It is uh, well appreciated that such models can show these different phases, or they have been seen in Monte Carlo. Uh, 
what is called minimum overlapping or uh, no overlapping condition that you said? At most one overlapping. Sorry, at most one overlapping. So that is essentially non-interacting case? No, of course they are interacting yeah. because so they can overlap. But after, af after it is mapped, on mm. can it be mapped onto something effectively non-interacting problem? No, it uh, maps into a dimer problem, which is actually kind of uh, interacting still. And still it is, uh, you claim that it can be put into the uh, you know, undergraduate textbook. That's why I was asking that uh, can yeah. it be simplified in some manner which where it looks like that it so is. So when you teach mere expansions, you can immediately in add this one paragraph. Mm -hmm. That's all. What is the advantage of studying this phenomena in d dimension when real fluids are in three dimension? You can extend all these results into three dimensions. There is no problem. I just, for pedagogical reasons, I kept it to two dimensions. Everything is extendable to three dimensions. There is no difficulty. Or d dimensions. Could be more than three. You can work in 15 dimensions if that is your favorite number. Oh. Okay, any other question? If not, uh, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you, Vasudhar. So we come to the close, not close, maybe I should say, we adjourn this session and we'll resume after tea at, uh, in the afternoon. <laughs>